morning we're continuing our work through the Sermon on the Mount and we're dealing with meeting God in simple words. I want to step out of the Sermon on the Mount for just a second and tell a story that, that covers the same information in the Gospel of Luke. In the Gospel of Luke, it comes to us in a story instead of in, a, uh, in the middle of a sermon. And the Lord's Prayer does. And so what happens is, in the Gospel of Luke, the disciples watch Jesus pray. And they come to Him and they say, Lord, teach us how to do that. John taught his disciples to pray, you teach us. Now, here's the thing you got to know about a good Jewish man, you know, anywhere in that culture. Teaching, saying, teach me how to pray is like saying, teach me how to breathe or teach me how to eat. You know, no, they know how to do this, right? This is not somebody going, I have no clue in what you're doing and I want to learn because I am completely ignorant. That might be true of, of some Americans. That was not true of any first century Jew. In fact, Compared to most of us modern Christians, even the most banal and, and backslidden first century Jew would have like a master's degree in prayer compared to us. Okay, They knew prayer. And yet, when they looked at that man, they saw something going on that they knew was different. They knew they were in the presence of something wondrous and very different from themselves. And they said, I have something to learn from you. So do we, right? We come to this man because he has something that we want. Something that is beautiful. And something that is not just inherently in us. I think prayer is inherently in us, but not his kind. And you find anybody anywhere, put enough pressure on them. I don't care what their belief system is. You put enough pressure on them, they're going to end up praying. You know, throw, there are no atheists in foxholes. You know, and when, when life gets really rough, people pray. It's what we do. But there's something about Him. It's good. It's beautiful. And it's rich. And I want to learn from Him what He does. You know, any time the disciples would be... Um, like There were times when they couldn't find Him. They were walking around going, somebody misplaced Jesus again. We've got to go find Jesus. And when you've got to go find Jesus, what are you going to find Him doing? Praying. He gets up early in the morning before the sun even comes up and he runs off and they go over and they're going to go wake up Jesus because he's missing breakfast. And no, he's not sleeping in. Where is the guy? He's been up for hours because he's been praying all that time. He spends all night in prayer. We're in a boat and it's going to go down. And where is he? Up there. You know, they're all over the place. This man has such a living, thriving prayer life. And before you go, well, that's because he's the Son of God. He's God. He knows how to do that because he's God. Remember, this is a human being. And when we look at him, we see a human being the way it's supposed to look. We see what human beings are supposed to look like in Jesus. His prayer habits are part of it. A fully alive human prays like this guy does. That's why his friends look at him and they go, okay, teach me to do that. I want to be able to do that. I want to be able to pray for hours. I want to be able to want to pray. Teach me how. You know, last week we worked through this phrase. If you weren't here, we spent a lot of time asking the question, does prayer work? And once again, I want to start with that question because I think an awful lot of why we, a lot of the prayerlessness that confronts our lives comes down to this question. What is it for? What is it doing? And it doesn't seem to do what I want it to do. For most of us, we know kind of what prayer is supposed to be. It's a straight shot. We know the path. I am where I am, and that's where I want to be. And so I'm going to use prayer to get there. And that's not always selfish. Sometimes it's horribly selfish. You know, I want a boat, so I'm going to pray for a boat. Right? I, I don't have a boat, and down there is me with a boat. I'm going to pray. I'm going to get there. You know, sometimes it's that kind of selfishness, but not always. I want my spouse to live. Or I, I want my dad to pull through. I want my parents' marriage to be okay. And I look down the road and I see it and I know that what prayer is for is for me getting what I want. I want my kid to be saved. And I look down the road and none of that's selfish, right? And that what prayer is about, isn't it about me getting what I want? Isn't that what it's for? 
And it's obvious that the question, does prayer work, leads to the destination of what do I mean by work? I mean getting what I want. That's what prayer is for. It's supposed to deliver. So I'm going to spend the time in the quiet, and God's going to give. That's His job. It's what the deity is for. Right? This leads very naturally to what Jesus criticizes here. This assessment that what prayer is for is a kind of magic. You know, it's supposed to, to work. If you say the right things, you'll get what you want. But you've got to say them the right way, or with the, maybe the right kind of heart, maybe. If you, if you can just figure out the correct mojo, then you'll get your prayer stuff. And Jesus says, no, when you pray, don't babble repetitively like the, like the Gentiles, repetitiously like the Gentiles, because they think that by their many words they will be heard. What is he talking about? He's talking about the, the nations around, and I'm not even, the, the nations around and their gods, I wouldn't want to talk to them. Good grief, would you want to talk to Zeus? You know, because when Zeus shows up, he might turn you into a tree. You know, I mean, there's a story where he does that. He's walking around a village, Zeus and Hermes, and there are people who are nice to him. They show him hospitality. He's like, I will honor you. Boom, you're a tree. Thanks. I would have done well without the honoring today, Zeus. I don't want to get his attention, so I'm not even sure what pagans are doing praying. But I actually know exactly what they're doing praying because it's all too common in my own prayer life when I face trouble and disaster and I know what prayer is for. They're looking for the right words to say to convince the deity to come do the thing. Other than coming and doing the thing, they really don't want the deity around. You know, I mean, because he might turn himself into a swan and do something horrible to you. You don't want that God around. You just don't. And so many of us are treating Yahweh like the pagans treat Zeus. If I just say the right thing, maybe they'll pull through. Now listen, I don't think that prayer is not about the world around us. I'm not going to tell you that. I have too many times seen moments where God worked wondrous miracle as a response to prayer. And I do think it's responsive. I think God actually moves. I had one time when I was, uh, when I was in New England and doing preaching there, I had a friend named Luke who came to me and he said, look, my brother, he's had this massive heart attack. And he's got to have surgery tomorrow. It's like a 98% blockage. And they're talking, he's, he's going to die. And they've got to get him stable before they can operate. Please pray for my brother. So, you know, and I don't know why, but the Holy Spirit moved me into prayer like I've never done before. I mean, I, I, I prayed for a long time and with a different intensity. I don't know how to describe the quality of that prayer to you, but it was, it was wondrous. The next day I got a call from Luke who said, the doctors have injected my brother with dye, and they're using the word miracle. Because last night, his heart grew new arteries. And they, they said, he said, I don't, I, they're using the word miracle. They've never seen this happen before. He said, I asked several of you to pray, and I think I needed to tell you, God heard your prayer. Thank you for praying for my brother. And I did what some of you I have no doubt are doing. What a coincidence. And then I had to go, wait a minute. Is there a God in heaven or not? Can my God raise the dead or not? How dare I ask Him to do something and then act like He couldn't? And I felt really ashamed of myself. You know, I'm not saying prayer is not about the outside world. I have seen too many coincidences that happen when I pray. Haven't you? But I don't believe that that's mainly what Jesus thinks prayer is for. And the reason that Jesus can spend so long in prayer is because He knows what it's really about. And He's looking at this and He's going, oh, these people, they don't really want Me. They want My stuff. They don't want God. They want what a God can do. And He's saying, don't make this mistake. Don't be like this Don't be like them because your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. 
Okay? Don't be like that. Don't look for the right magic words. And before we move on, I want to point this out. Jesus in this section of the, of the Sermon on the Mount talks about three spiritual disciplines. He talks about giving to the poor, talks about prayer, and he talks about fasting. In all three of them, he urges secrecy. He says, you keep that to yourself. Don't let anybody know you're doing it. With prayer alone, he introduces the concept of simplicity. But I'll tell you that both secrecy and simplicity are after something else. The reason you do secrecy and the reason you do simplicity is not so that it will work. The reason so that you do it, that you do those things is so that it can be real. You're looking at the difference between real prayer and rubber duck prayer. You're looking for authenticity. The reason you keep this thing to yourself so that it's just between you and God as we looked at last week is so that your prayer can actually address God and not be for show to show off to other people. The reason you do this simply is because you keep in mind who you're talking to. You're after authenticity with both of those practices. He's trying to make your prayer real. That's why He's teaching this. So that it won't be a false spirituality. Because false spirituality has no fruit. A shallow spirituality is non-transformative. A prayer that does not actually engage God does not change the heart of the person who says the prayer. If it changes it in any way, it makes it meaner and nastier and crueler. And have you run into the Christian who is practicing a false spirituality? Yes, you have. Have you ever been the Christian who practices a false spirituality? And so have I. I look back over the times of meanness in my life, the times of arrogance and cruelty and foolishness, and I look at those times and I think, why are those in me? And it's because I've been a rubber duck when I was called to be alive. I've insisted on continuing to be the puppet when I was called to be the real boy, and I don't want to. I want to be Pinocchio and have my nose grow. We are called to live, and that's what Jesus is doing. And you know you've got real spirituality going on when you find yourself surprised by goodness in you. Or you find yourself surprised when someone else observes goodness in you and you didn't know it was there. That's when you know this is going on. And you know you've got something awful going on when someone comes and points out a mess in you. Spirituality brings us life. And genuine prayer will change the heart. Now, how do I get to that genuine prayer? It's because your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. You need to know that ancient prayer did not call God Father. Ancient Jewish prayer was marvelously transcendent. It talked about, oh God, the God of Abraham. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of my fathers. Not my Father. Okay. If you were a convert to Judaism... When you prayed, you had to say, O God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You couldn't even say, O God of my father, because it isn't your father. And you couldn't talk to God directly. It's like you had to talk through a Jew. To be honest with you, I'd do that. i got this great Jewish man who sits at the right hand of the Father and talks to him for me. I absolutely talk through a Jew. Jesus Christ. But in the ancient world, the God was very far away. Transcendent and mighty above the heavens and filled with glory and honor and beauty. And He certainly wasn't my dad. But the way that Jesus is talking about praying, this is something closer. And it encourages me to think about a God who is very, very different from that far off, maybe a little bit angry, certainly pure and holy, and too good to get very close to me, God. Tell you what, I would give anything to do that. When I was nine years old, the man that I called dad went out of my life. He was not a perfect man. He wasn't. He was good and he was awful and he was beautiful and he was violent. And I, I loved him and I was terrified of him, but I would give anything if I could walk with him. Or even more, to watch my children walk with him beside a particular lake in Tennessee. Give anything for that. Because I want to spend time with Him. 
Don't you want to be with your... Those of you who have lost your dad, wouldn't you like to walk with him? Wouldn't it be great just to have coffee for an hour? Because you know that man loves you. That that person relishes your laughter and your joy. Some of you didn't have a good father, but you know what a father should have been, right? One who delighted in you. Took joy in you. Celebrated in your accomplishments and in what you could become. This is what God is like. This is what Jesus is telling us God is is like. And so he's saying, your father doesn't need to be convinced to be good to you. You don't have to approach him with the right magic words. You just need to come and be with him and let him be with you. Because he looks at you the same way your daddy did when you hit that home run and you look back into the stands and you were laughing and he was standing up cheering. That's your God. When you brought home the successful homework and He said, way to go! I'm so proud of you. When you sat down with Him as an older person and you talked to Him about something that was going on in your life and He talked to you and gave you advice and you went away going, man, I'm so... That's God. That's what He's like. He's like a daddy. And don't you know it's great to spend time with Him? A genie in a lamp, you want to bring it out when you need it. And you got to be really careful about what you ask for. Because if you ask for the wrong thing, He's going to give it to you and you're going to wish you didn't have it. You ever hear people who say, I prayed for patience. Wish I'd never prayed for patience. Because now all this trouble came along. Yeah, the trouble came, but didn't you get patience too? Because what you asked for was not trouble, it was patience. He gave it to you. He helped you through that, didn't He? It was at least accessible to you because you asked for it. Because your Father knows what you need and He wants to be good to you and He loves you and He's good. This is a different way of praying, isn't it? I mean, already, before we even get into the Lord's Prayer, we're seeing, wow, that's a beautiful and very different kind of approach to prayer. That's something I want to spend time doing. So as he comes into pray into prayer, he says, okay, this is how you ought to pray. Now, I do think that, frankly, we ought to pray these words way more often than we do. There is great power in these words. He's teaching us to pray, and it's a good and beautiful prayer. I don't know why so many of us in Churches of Christ are afraid to pray a prayer that somebody else came up with the words. If God came up with the words, it's probably a good idea to pray that. But he's going to say, he doesn't just say, pray this. He says, pray like this. This is how you pray. So here comes a model prayer. And man, is it good and beautiful. Let's, let's look at it. Oh, by the way, I want to do this slide. What Jesus is about to do is not lead us on a straight road that gets me from where I am to where I want. There's the thing I want. We're going to go on a twisting road that we evaluate, where we go on a journey. That we honestly, I don't know that most of us know the destination. I'll be honest with you, I don't know what a perfect me looks like. I really don't. But I think that's the destination of this prayer. And so I go on a journey with the Lord and I step into what's mysterious and strange so that I can find my way to what I really want. My twisted and broken heart thinks it knows what it wants. And it wants a lot of things. I've got to go on a twisted journey to find what I actually want. because um, And at that point, I'll often find that what I wanted, I didn't want. Because what I really want is the Lord my God and the heart that only He can give. And that's what prayer is really for. So let's, let's look at this prayer. Our Father in heaven, the name that is Yours, let it be holy. The kingdom that is Yours, let it come. The will that is Yours, let it be done as in the heavens, so also on the earth. Have you heard that translation before? And Probably not. Uh, this came from a friend of mine at Lubbock Christian who did an intense study of the Lord's Prayer. His name is Michael Martin. Beautiful man, beautiful heart, and he did this beautiful study. One of the things that he pointed out is that you know, often in our sing-song approach to this, we say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Those two couplets go together. And then, Your uh, kingdom come, your will be done. Those go together. And on earth, as all that are in the heavens. You know that? Okay. 
This is a much better breakdown of the opening of the prayer. You first address Him as Father, and you call Him Father. There is such huge power in remembering that you are a child of God. Huge power in that. And I say it, though honestly, about me, it's not entirely true. I don't know about you, I'm not going to judge you, but I know me, and I know my heart, and I know my compulsions and my will and my sins. They're always in front of me, and I know that His name, His family name never does any of that. I am an adopted son. But he's saying, come and call me dad and live here in my home and you learn my ways. And you look at me as father and you treat me as father and you will become my son. So every time we pray, we are stepping into this aspiration, this hope for a future that's not here yet. This long, And it's becoming more and more real. We've learned table manners already, right? Soon we will learn values and ethics and all of it and it will be whole in us. And a day will come when we belong in the heavens. Right now we're on the earth. And so we say, Father. Father who's already there. Because that's where I want to be. There are three lines, these three petitions right at the beginning. And uh, when Michael translated this, he says, the name that is yours, let it be sung. Now he did that in part so that it would rhyme because the, the rhythm of the prayer in Greek does have almost a poetic flavor to it. But the, what he was trying to capture is that word, let it be made holy or kept holy or be hallowed. But it, what it fully means is, God, may I step into the holiness of Your name and may I, this is what you're asking for, may I live my life in such a way that Your name is seen in me. That Your holiness is seen in me. And I don't bring any shame to the family name. I've called you Dad. Which means if I've called you dead, then I'm your son or your daughter, so I am bearing the family name. Help me to bring honor to it. Help me to worship that name. Help me to lead other people to look at you and want to sing about how good you are. I want to be that. And so I'm praying, God, give me the nature inside of myself that brings honor to your name. The kingdom that is yours, let it come. When we pray for the kingdom of God, what we are praying for is that God's reign should break out in this world so resistant to it. The world doesn't want to be generous. The world doesn't want to love. We've got political systems here. And listen, if I can just for a moment, I've listened hard to the political system's description of each other. Let me tell you what you're, you know, whichever side of the aisle you live on, let me give you what what is probably an accurate description, because you want to know what you're like? Listen to your enemies. Okay, So on one side of the aisle, you got the people who want to soak the rich and hate the rich and take it and give it to the undeserving poor. And they want to treat the poor like they can't be anything, and they want to cripple them with programs that hurt them. On the other side of the aisle, you got people who want to encourage selfishness and encourage, just give it all to the rich because I want to be rich and let's just keep it there. And they want to encourage a kind of mean-spiritedness to those who have nothing. Now, are either of those accurate? No, of course not. But they're partially accurate. Absolutely they are. We live in Adam's world, and Adam's systems are filled with Adam's nature. This is a different kingdom. It's not like the Democrats or the Republicans, but it is a kingdom. It's a political system, and it's run on love. At the core of it is love. And so love looks at the poor and says, you know what, I want to love you and help you. I do not want to cripple you with money that expects nothing. I want to love you with friendship. Step beside you and care about you until you walk on your own. I want to help you to that. It looks at the rich and says, I want to inspire selflessness in you, not hoarding. That's God's kingdom. It's different from ours. And so you're praying, may a different kingdom come. Where? In me. Let me be a citizen of that other place. Fill me up with heaven's value system. And may the kingdom break forth right here on the earth because I am. I'm here. So I will pray, God, that you will make something good out of me so that your will can break forth in this world. Oops. Let me go back. And then finally, that will that is yours, 
I mean, what is the will of God? That people be merciful to each other? That they be gracious toward one another? That they forgive one another? That they don't take advantage of one another or consume one another? That they live in constants together? That their relationships have permanence and beauty? That's the will of God. That you actually be a whole and good person as part of a whole and good society in a beautiful kingdom. May your will be done. By who? By you! You're the one praying it! He's saying, may I be this. And so these opening prayer, this opening word is saying, God, I step into submission to You and I want Your ways to happen. Because they're already happening in heaven. Let them happen here. I'm here. I'm stuck in this pitiful place and I'm stuck in this pitiful me. But no, that is not what I want. I want to come to You and I want You to remake my heart. Please, let's do this thing and help me to be a participant in Your ways and Your kingdom. Let me honor Your name. Isn't that beautiful? He then says, give us today the bread that is necessary. What is that in most of our memory? Daily bread, right? The word for daily there is something called a... uh, Oh, good grief, I've forgotten the word for it. It's a word that only happens once. The only place in your New Testament, and it's a really rare word in Greek, that that word ever shows up is in the Lord's Prayer. So it's twice. Here in Matthew and in Luke. That word daily. And it's, one, it's a word that people look at and go, yeah, I really don't know what that means. They don't know what Jesus meant by it. That daily bread thing. It, uh, the, it's epiousia, and usia means substance. You know, So what does epiousia, what does that even mean? Well, there's a bunch of options. One of them is daily, but the thing is, Greek's got another word for daily, so it's probably not daily. It could be sufficient, like give us enough bread. You know, it could be the bread of tomorrow, so that we have enough bread for tomorrow, or it could be the the bread of the end of time, like this. You realize that every time you take the Lord's Supper, you are prefiguring the end of time. You take this until He comes. Because when He comes, we're going to take something much richer and fuller and more wonderful. This is, I think, a prayer for the end of time. Come, God, give us the feast. Even here, may we be those who dine on heaven's food. Help us to see that our souls need nourishment. So we come again and again to the table that when He teaches this prayer, He hadn't set up yet. But we come again and again and we eat the bread of tomorrow. We eat the feast looking forward to an even better tomorrow. We set our hearts into a future not yet here. He says, and forgive us our debts as we ourselves have forgiven our debtors. That's often translated as forgive us our trespasses or forgive us our sins. It probably is the best translation is debts, which is financial. It's about money. What is this talking about? He's saying, well, forgive us what we owe you, God, as we forgive those who owe us money? What? What is he even talking about? He's talking about something specific to his faith. The faith of Judaism. At, the, at a, at a uh, 50th year, every 50th year, all over the land of Israel, there's supposed to be the sound of the trumpet. The trumpets announce the year of Jubilee. And the year of Jubilee is the day when the slaves are set free and all the debts are canceled. Whatever you owed is gone. It's all wiped clean. If you ever carried a student loan, Jubilee is a really beautiful concept. All of your credit card debt, gone. All of your student loan debt, gone. All of your housing debt, gone. All of it. It resets everything in the economic system. Good reason to think that they never actually practiced this. It's commanded in the law, but I'm not sure that they ever did it. There's no reference to it actually being carried out. But he's telling us to pray for it. God, may I be so faithful to you that I practice the economics of heaven where I forgive others their actual debts, real, honest to goodness money that they owe me. Let me let it go that you might let it go for me. Because certainly I owe you a lot more than anybody owes me. May I actually practice the things... Why would He set up Jubilee? Well, what kind of heart would it shape? 
What kind of heart would Jubilee actually shape? Maybe one that can't take money too seriously because you know you're going to have this hard reset once a generation. If you're born at the wrong time, maybe twice in a generation, right? So I can't care about money. i got to care about people. God, I want my heart shaped by that. I want to be like that. I do not want to get caught up in the foolishness of the things that are dying and will never rise again. I want to be caught up in the things that live forever. Lead me into that. Help me to forgive debts so that I also can live in forgiveness. And don't lead me into temptation, but deliver me from evil. This is the core of the whole prayer. The reason I've said all that other stuff is because I am stuck, God. I am wrestling with things that overcome me again and again and again and again. I am tired of being beaten and defeated and knocked down. Get me out of this cycle and deliver me from evil. As You rescued the slaves from Egypt so long ago, so also rescue me from my slavery to my sins and help me to live with You because You have the power to do it because Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. And you see how different that prayer is from I want a car? It's even different from I want my my spouse to live. This is a prayer that is meant to change your heart. It takes you on that long and twisting journey so that you can find your way to a place you've never been, but He has. And He's the only one who is equipped to lead us into perfect life. The only one who's ever been there. And so he comes and he says, you want to know what prayer looks like? This is how I pray. I pray about God. And I pray about God's life alive in me. And that's why it is. You do it too. So you can walk with your Father. Come with Him. And He will take you to beautiful places. The most beautiful of which of all is your own heart. Walk with Him. He has one concluding thought about this. He says, for if we forgive others their sins, and here it is, sins. You forgive other people their sins, your Heavenly Father will forgive you, but if you do not forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. It's one last announcement. Your prayer must be authentic. Let your life be consistent with your prayers. Line up and do everything that is in your power to do so that you match this prayer. And as you do it, you will inhabit the forgiveness of God. His forgiveness will grow up inside of you and you will be able to forgive others. And as you do that, you will recognize and discover your own forgiveness. But if you don't, then you become like the Pharisees who murdered the Lord. Don't do it. They prayed a lot. They changed not at all. Do you see what prayer is for? When we ask this question, does prayer work? You do it Jesus' way. You walk into the Father's heart. You hold hands with Him at sunset and you better believe that it will. You will be a different man or a different woman if you walk with the Lord than you would be if you didn't. That's what it's for. If you look into your own heart this morning and you say, you know what? (laughs) I'm not doing that. And the evidence of it is all over me. I stink of sin that could be cleansed and it isn't. Let us know. We will pray for you. We will pray the Lord's Prayer with you and for you. And we will walk together with you. It may be that you came to this place that you know, you're know you carrying something. It's got nothing to do with what we talked about, but you want the care of the saints. Let us know. We want to pray for you. And if you're not a Christian, no better day than right now. Why don't you come now while we stand and sing?